Well, again, it's a real pleasure for me to be able to be here with you today um, as your pastors are away today and to be able to share. Um, it's been a great joy for me uh, over the years to know uh, Pastor Trish. I knew her back in the day um, when I was appointed to St. Paul in Lusby. Uh, back in the early 90s, her family was there, and so I knew her, uh, I don't know if it was late elementary or if she was in middle school already. I haven't done the math to figure that out, and I can't quite remember, but I uh, knew her then, and then um, saw her come along and just uh, grow and develop in, in wonderful ways. Uh, she was the president of the youth ministry in that church, and she was the best youth ministry president I've ever had. She would personally greet each person coming in at the door and made sure everyone felt comfortable and everyone felt at home. It was just awesome. And you can imagine the effect of that. The youth ministry was part of what helped the youth ministry in that church really explode. Uh, she also uh, went uh, to camp with me uh, several years before she herself um, went on staff at West River. And um, she, I saw her take situations with campers who were having a tough week and were homesick and wanted to go home and just, they just couldn't get it together to kind of feel acclimated to camp. And I saw her take those situations and turn them around and befriend those young people and um, have, help them have a fantastic week by the end of it. So um, she just has a tremendous uh, sense of justice and a tremendous love for people. And so it's been my privilege over the years to gradually, um, as she's come along, become a colleague and a good friend. We've traveled together. We went to the Holy Land uh, in January together um, as part of a group. And she's also been on mission trips with me uh, to Russia. And uh, so it's just a real privilege to be here today in her stead. So the scripture lesson for today is one that's very familiar to you. And you can probably say it from memory. You see signs at ball games with John 3.16 on it, right? And uh, everybody knows this scripture. It's kind of one of the best known scriptures along with the 23rd Psalm. And yet, what does it really mean? And so hopefully today, in the midst of my sharing some thoughts and some stories about it, kind of uh, along illustrating pieces of it, it'll be helpful for you. Maybe something will click in a new way or a deeper way for you. And if not, maybe there'll be something that you can take and use in a conversation with a friend or a colleague uh, or someone who you want to get to know the Savior of ours. So let's devote this time to God as we go in prayer. Gracious God, now I pray that you would let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts together here today be acceptable in your sight. Lord, you are indeed our rock, and you are our redeemer. Amen. For God. For God. God, like the story of the creation, the story of salvation begins with God. A God who is almighty and yet amazingly gentle and kind. A God who is perfectly just and yet perfectly loving. The God who spanned the heavens and put everything into motion in the stories of, story of creation, in Genesis chapter 1 of the fourth day of creation, we have almost as a throwaway line, he also created the stars. There are, what, 300 billion stars in our galaxy and some 300 billion galaxies that we know of in the universe. He also created the stars and structured the atom and the smallest subatomic particles. And yet in all of that vastness, knows each of us personally. This is the God of the Bible. This is the God who is behind our salvation for God. And the story of salvation is the story of us being made right together in relationship with God, isn't it? You know, sometimes people think, well, you know, I, I want to be right with God. I want to be in relationship with God, but too much has happened in my life. Or there are some things I want to get done first, and, and maybe someday... Or let me get my act together, let me get my life in place, and then I'll get right with God. 
They say of the poet Lord Byron, one of the greatest poets in the English language, he was brilliant all of his life. Even as a little child, he was brilliant. And they say that one day he stood up in the little tub of his bath and he gave a little sermon. And the sermon went like this. People, be good. Because then God will love you and you will be happy. People, be good. You can just see little kids saying that, can't you? The thing is, brilliant as he was, he had it backwards. Because we don't get good so that God will love us. Rather, God loves us. And because of his action graciously towards us, he enables us to live a life he's called us to live. Jeremiah said, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And I called you, Jeremiah, to be a prophet to the nations. This is the God, the God who goes before us and has made this gift of relationship and salvation possible for us. In my family, the Harold family, we have this quirky little thing that's called the youngest son watch. It's family heirloom. Um, it was my grandfather's, it was my great-grandfather's before that, it was my grandfather's, he was the youngest surviving son in his family, he gets passed on to the youngest son. My father was the youngest of four sons, it sits now on his mantle, it doesn't run, the works are shot, he's looked into having him replaced, just hasn't had the heart to do it, you know, because it's, it's not worth anything, it's just the emotional connection of this heirloom. I am the only son, so I'm the default son in my generation, and then it will pass on to my younger son, Nicholas, someday when I go to the big watch factory in the sky. And there's nothing that I can do to earn that watch. That watch was provided for me over 100 years ago when some ancestor, and I'm not even sure who it was now, bought the watch. But as sure as I'm standing here, it will eventually, barring some cataclysm, come to me and then pass on to my son. There's nothing I can do to earn it. All I can do is accept it when the time comes. Your salvation was purchased on a hill outside of Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. By the pouring out of the blood of the Son of God, there's nothing you can do to add to or take away from that gift. It comes to you as sure as the one who offers it to you. Yours is simply to accept it. For God. For God so loved. Right? Now, we think of love, there's all kinds of different loves in the world. Love is a word that we use all kinds of different ways. Sometimes we think of romantic love, and the Bible actually talks about God's love in those terms. See the Song of Solomon in the Old Testament. That's in everybody's Bibles these days. But back in rabbinic times, in the, up until the early Middle Ages, it was considered so racy that you had to be 35 and safely married before you were allowed to read it. Because it is vivid in its passionate imagery. It was taken to mean God's love for his people. We know that kind of love. We have it in English literature. Shakespeare, one of his sonnets says, let me not to the, true, to the marriage of true minds amid impediments. That love is not love, which alters when it alteration finds or bends with the remover to remove. Oh no, it is an ever fixed mark, which looks on tempest and is never shaken. It is the star to every wandering bark, whose worth's unknown, although its height be taken. We understand that love. And sometimes the Bible uses that to describe God's love for his people. But more often, the love that we see expressed is another kind of family relationship. Sometimes it's elder brother, but most often it's the love of a parent to a child or a father to his children. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. That is the most frequent expression of it. And we see that um, in the scripture. And, and it's one that for many of us who are parents is evocative in a particular way. 
Um, I remember years ago that uh, when I was just a very young man, I was getting ready, we were getting ready to have our first uh, children. Um, and uh, my first son is John, and he was born in, in the mid-80s, and it was back then. And I like to go and hang out. We uh, play these role games with friends of mine. I was a grad student at the time. And one of the guys had two young children, and he had been a bit of a partier in his earlier days. Um, in fact, he'd been quite the pothead in his earlier days. And he and his wife had had two children. They just had their second child when uh, I got to know him. And as we talked together, I was expectant father, and he was a father, and he was talking about the change in his life that came about as a result of his becoming a father. And I'll never forget what he said. He said, you know, there was a time when I was the last generation. Everything was done for me. But then you have your child, and you're no longer the last generation. There's someone after you who depends upon you in whose life you're invested in. And then the words that stuck with me, he said, you know, I would rather die a thousand horrible deaths than have the least thing happen to one of my kids. That's always stuck with me. And as a father, eventually, I found out exactly what that feeling is like. All of us who are parents, we know that feeling, right? We would rather die a thousand horrible deaths than have the least thing happen that would be harmful to our little one. Well, on that hill called Calvary, Christ died a death. In fact, he died a thousand, a million, countless horrible deaths, all rolled up into one for all the sons and daughters of humankind who are distant from God and alienated from God and in need of the grace of God. That is what Jesus did. That is what our salvation is about. Now, I know for some folks, the whole image of fatherhood is difficult. And it can be difficult for lots of reasons. It can be difficult because we had issues with our own father, perhaps a father who was neglectful or abusive or absent. And so if that's you, I would, I would consider that the ultimate solution to that problem is not to take the image that you experienced and sort of magnify that as your understanding of God, but to learn about the God of Scripture, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to reshape your understanding of human fatherhood along those lines. But in the meantime, find another image that works for you. Perhaps it's the image of motherhood, or a grandmother, or a teacher, or someone who has been that presence in your life that has pointed you on the way to life and on the way Godward. Let that person be the model for you. Many years ago, there was a, a woman uh, who lived in Germany whose son went off to university, and on holiday one year, he went down into Italy and was hiking in the Alps and rock climbing in the Alps. And while he was there with his companions, he was crossing a glacier when an avalanche broke loose. And millions of tons of rock and debris came down the mountain, and he was buried and he lost his life. The mother wanted to reclaim his body, so she came down into Italy and met with the local officials to see about recovering the body of her son. And they told her, ma'am, it is impossible. We would love to help you. But since that avalanche, there have been two more, and there's absolutely no way that we're going to be able to recover his body. The mother would take, not take no for an answer. And she would not give up on recovering the remains of her son. So she went herself to the place where he had been lost. And she brought in crews of locals, people from the village who heard her story, who she either hired or they wanted to come and help her. And day by day, all day long, for more than a month, they physically, sometimes by hand, removed debris until at last she recovered the body of her son and could take him home. Our Lord has covered an infinite distance in order to recover each of us and bring back not just our bodies, but to bring us back alive and restored into his presence and into relationship with him.
For God so loved the world. For God so loved the world. When John uses the word, word, word world here, what he means is the whole created order. Now, if you're a student of Paul and you've done disciple Bible study, you know that when Paul uses the word world, he means all of that which is in opposition to God. That's not what John means here. John, sometimes New Testament writers use the same word, they use it a little bit differently. John means all the created order and those who live within it. God so loved the world, the world, all of it, not just those who belong to a certain country, not just those who are part of a certain religious group, not just those who are smart or attractive or successful or even competent, not even just those who love God, but God loves all of us. Those who are hurt and broken. Those who have histories that they'd rather others didn't know about. Those who have things in their life now that they're struggling with. And even perhaps especially those who are estranged from God, those who despise God, God's heart breaks just as much for them. God loves the world. Perhaps you've heard the story about a young man who went into a Hallmark shop and he said that he wanted to buy a very special card for his very special lady. He wanted to buy a special card to express his feelings to his girlfriend. And so the clerk in the shop said, I've got just the thing. I think I've got something that you will just really, really love. So she went to the shelf and she pulled off a card and handed it to him. And when he looked at it, his eyes lit up. The words on the card were, to the only girl I have ever loved. He said, to the only girl I've ever loved. That's perfect. I love it. That's just great. I'll take six of them. <laughs> now, I don't know if his issue was commitment or if it was just deciding or what the deal was. But I tell that story because God loves each of us so much that he couldn't love any of us anymore if we were the only person on earth. But God so loved the world that he gave. He gave. In his justice, he could have condemned, he could have destroyed, he could have distanced himself, but he gave his only son so that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. I mentioned that um, I sometimes make mission trips to Russia, and Trisha, Pastor Trisha has been over there with me. And one of the places that we typically go is a uh, camp that is a United Methodist camp near the city of Voronezh. And this used to be a factory-related rest camp during the days of the Soviet Union. A lot of big camps, and Voronezh had a big electronics factory. Um, a lot of the factories had their own rest camps for families to go to. And this was a primo camp in the Soviet days. But uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, the factory went bankrupt during privatization, and the camp sat for several years, and then it went on the auction block. It was eventually purchased with money raised by United Methodist Sunday School children in Germany, and it was purchased for the conference there in Russia. And by the time it came to the Russian Methodists, it was a serious fixer-upper, let me tell you. It was in rough, rough shape. The first year that um, I was there at the camp, um, that any of us went, I was there with a team of folks. It was back in 06. And part of the job that we had, they had to assess the buildings to decide whether they were actually serviceable or not. They decided they were. And we were supposed to go into the cantina or dining hall building. And on the lower level, they wanted to open up some space. They had determined which walls were load-bearing and which weren't, and they wanted us to tear out some of the unnecessary walls. Now, that sounds like not such a difficult task, right? Because here in the States, you would go in, and there'd be drywall, right? You'd knock out the drywall, and you'd patch it up, and it would be all fine. 
But in Soviet times, they didn't use drywall. These were cinder block walls. And so a crew of us, all week long, with sledgehammers, our job was to knock out the cinder block walls and remove them from the inside. And, and then we were asked to preserve the good block as material that could be reused. So a lot of times we could take out two, three, four block at one blow and we would chip off the mortar and make a nice stack of them. Sometimes they would be cracked or broken because, you know, knocking them with sledgehammers, right? And so we had quite a growing pile outside of the half blocks, quarter blocks, and pieces of block that we were knocking out. So we felt pretty good about the progress we were making. We opened up a whole section of the lower floor. And then about the fourth day we were there in the afternoon. We were coming back, I think, from the river, from having gone down for a swim on the warm summer afternoon. And one of our number noticed that some of the Russian girls, the young women, were behind one of the buildings where the piles were. So they went to investigate what was going on. The young Russian women were back there with small hammers and with some of the half blocks and quarter blocks. And they were knocking the mortar off very carefully, these blocks on our trash pile. And they were making a new pile with those blocks. You see, when we Americans heard, keep the good blocks, we thought that meant keep the whole blocks, the ones that were intact. But building material was too expensive, and the church was too short of funds, and they couldn't afford to waste those half blocks and those quarter blocks. And so they were carefully preserving them for reuse, and they hadn't wanted to embarrass the American helpers by telling us that we were doing it wrong, right? So they were doing it on the sly, behind our backs, but we found out about it anyway. And we were both embarrassed a little bit by our, what our own affluence had blinded us to, but it also was a lesson for us, because it seemed to us to be a metaphor for life. You see, we live in a world where we look at people and people who are maybe not perfect, people who have a crack in their life, people that something maybe has been missing or broken off over the years, because something has happened in their career or their family where things have gone a little awry or the circumstances of life have just left their impression. The world looks at those folks and says they don't matter quite as much. But as Christians, God looks at those lives and we know that he sees something beautiful, something useful that can be reused and cared for and become part of the work that he's doing in the world. That good doesn't mean perfect as the world looks at it. Maybe you're a person here today who you've been struggling a little bit about this thing, about being connected with God, about being right with God. Maybe there's something in your life that's kind of been holding you back a little bit. It's like, how can God accept me? How can I really follow through with trusting him completely? And if that's you, I would encourage, or maybe someone you know is in that position. And maybe that is a story that could help you get your mind around and your heart around what it means for God to have given himself so that we might have that fullness of life that he has for us, broken and imperfect though we may be. One more story and then I'll stop. And this is a story that probably some of you heard this week if you've been listening to the news because it was a couple of times on national public radio this week. There was a very, very interesting story this week about a recovered instrument. Roman Totenberg was a virtuoso violinist and one of the most sought after teachers of virtuosi, virtuosi violinists, I guess, in the United States. And years and years ago, he had thrilled audiences, moved them to tears with his performances, with his wonderful instrument he had. 
It was a Stradivarius violin, an original made in the 18th century. And these Stradivari have names. His was called the Ames Stradivarius violin. They're numbered. They're on a catalog. Everybody knows about this because there's not that many of them in the world. And he had just done masterful things with this instrument. Well, about 35 years ago, he had just played a concert. And he had put the instrument away in his office and then went to a reception. And when he came back, the instrument was gone. It had been stolen, vanished. For years, the family thought they knew who had taken it. Turned out they were right. But they couldn't prove anything. And they didn't have enough for the investigation to go forward and actually try to recover the instrument. The person who had stolen it, turned out, was a student of Mr. Totenberg's. And he had hidden it away in a closet in his house. He couldn't do anything with it. He couldn't take it out and try to sell it because, as I said, there's catalogs of these. They're named. He would have been fingered instantly as the thief. And so he carried this secret like a burden, this thing that he had taken, a thing of great beauty. But it sat silent in a closet for over 30 years. Ultimately, the thief died. And sadly, Mr. Totenberg died. His family said he eventually got over it. He bought, an, he sold some other violins to buy another, it couldn't be a Stradivarius, but he bought another great violin. Completely we reworked his repertoire for the new instrument because the repertoire was keyed to the particular instrument. But he passed away. And then when the surviving spouse of the thief tried to sell and get appraised the violin that was left to her, the appraiser recognized it and said, I think this is the missing instrument, and connected with the FBI who came in. And indeed, it was found to be the missing Ames Stradivarius. Thankfully, in perfect condition, it had not been maintained, but it had not been damaged either still had the original gut strings on it. They don't make those anymore. And so now it's been recovered by the family and will be passed on to another virtuoso violinist. But the thing that I want to get at here is for 35 years, an instrument that was there to make beautiful music sat silent in a closet because it had been stolen and hidden away by someone who could not use it. And to me, that is, a, that is a metaphor for the condition of many Christian hearts. We have a song within us. We have something that our Savior has put into us, the joy of salvation, the presence of God's Spirit, the knowledge of deliverance, the blessing of God's presence. But because something has happened in our life, it's locked up tight. And it is silent. And again, if that's you today, my hope and my prayer for you is that you would allow God, allow this message of God's love for you and his salvation for you to unlock that closet in your heart. And to let that song come forth and play again boldly and clearly and beautifully as it was meant to do. Because God so loved the world that he gave his only son, his most precious possession, so that whoever believes in him, you can finish it for me, should not perish, but have everlasting life. Let us pray. Lord, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your amazing love for us in Jesus Christ. Father, maybe some of us here this morning are just humming a precision tune as we walk in grace, as we're serving you. Everything's going splendidly, and we're on that upward track towards entire sanctification, and it's all great. But God, I suspect that there's at least one or two people here this morning, maybe, who are struggling with something. 
maybe struggling with just knowing you, understanding how what you did at Calvary affects their life now. Maybe understanding how they, as a person who is broken and imperfect, can be part of something beautiful that you're constructing, can have a real purpose in the kingdom. Maybe they've been holding back, and Lord, this is the day, this is the moment that you would nudge them forward and give them the courage to say, yes, there's a crack in my life, there's been a problem in my life, but by the grace of God, I know God can use me, and I'm going to step forward and trust in him. And maybe, God, there's someone here this morning, maybe there's someone here this morning who that song has just gone silent in their hearts. Oh, they knew it years ago, they felt it years ago, but... The wear and tear of life and things that have happened and relationships that have been broken and just hurt, maybe things that we've done or someone's done to us have stolen the song. The song has gone silent. Father, I pray if that describes anyone here today, that Lord, your spirit would work sovereignly within them just to open up that place in their hearts that that song might come out again and that its strains might vibrate and, and lift their spirit and lift the spirits of others around them. Lord, you have called us to salvation. You've called us to be a people of blessing, not only for ourselves, but for others. I pray, Lord, that you would bless Epworth Church and that you would let this whole community resonate with this song that comes from this place. This we ask in the name of Jesus, who came the great distance, who died our death, and who lives and reigns so that we too might know eternal life and joy in our loving God. Amen.